Chapter 10 of the Story of Geronimo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Story of Geronimo by Jim Kajilgard. Chapter 10 A Chief Dies sitting on a hillock beside victorio geronimo's restless eyes sought the valley beneath the next hill and the hills beyond often he turned his head to look behind him the years had taught geronimo that an enemy might come from anywhere at any time he who failed to see the enemy first was apt to die swiftly victorio's eyes searched the hills too despite a frown that told of a troubled mind. Is it possible, he said, as he continued his conversation with Geronimo, that the Mangus Coloradus who was leaked out through the white soldier's bullet hole? We did not bring the same chief from Janos that we took to the medicine man. I have often wondered if the Mexican doctor did not put a spell upon him, Geronimo remarked. Many times I have thought of going back to Janos and killing him, but I have thought each time that even Mangus Coloradus could not suffer such a wound without being ill. It is a natural thing. A natural thing, Victorio agreed. And for many days he was ill. Remember the snail pace we were forced to keep when we finally left Janos? It is a good thing we were many, for even Mexicans might have overtaken us. But Mangus Coloradus is ill no longer. Still he counsels that Apaches must make peace with the white man, or there will be no more Apaches. Geronimo said, he lives much in the spirit world. I entered his wiki up to speak to him, and he said, I'm happy to see you once more, Delgadito. Now you must tell our people that we cannot conquer these Americans as we did the Mexicans. Ha! Delgadito died many years ago in a battle with Mexicans, yet Mangus Coloradus talked with him when he should have been talking with me. It chilled me, for I cannot talk with spirits. Nor can I, said Victorio. I can talk only with people and be guided only by them and by my own common sense. Good sense tells me that if we do not fight the Americans, they will overrun us and there will be no more Apaches anyway. In spite of the fact that they still war among themselves, they have soldiers to spare for Apache land. White men who come among us are more instead of fewer but only the Chiricahuas still fight them. Mangus Coloradus points that out, Geronimo said. The warriors of Cochise kill and are killed by soldiers, cattle drivers, and rock scratchers who are forever looking for gold. But it is as though every dead white man is a seed from which two more might spring up. Do you think that, Victorio questioned? There is a reason for so thinking, Geronimo said, but I also think we must fight until every white man is driven from our land or until all Apaches are killed. If white men become our masters, we shall know sorry times indeed. Do you know they call us thieves, liars, murderers, and every other vile name their tongues can form? Ha! Huh. Any Apache can take lessons in thievery, lying, and murder from any white man. What do you mean? asked Victorio. Geronimo said, When the white man warred against Mexico, Apaches sold them horses and mules and brought them food. We told them to take the places called Sonora and Chihuahua, and we would help. They accepted our help when it was needed. The war ended, and for a time no more was heard. Then came a surveyor named Bartlett, and he sent word that he was a good friend to all Apaches. We believed and trusted him, 
but when we brought our Mexican slaves to his camp, Bartlett took them away. It seems that, when the war ended, Americans and Mexicans became brothers. Bartlett said it was wrong to make slaves of his brothers. He said also that the Americans, God frowns upon those who keep slaves. Ha! I have since learned that the Americans keep millions of slaves themselves. It was a great lie, Victorio said. A very great lie, Geronimo agreed, but far from the greatest. Bartlett's real purpose in coming here was to mark where this land ends and Mexico begins. The Americans were at war with Mexico. They might have taken the whole country by force of arms, but when they wanted land, they bought and paid for it. That was very silly, and it was just as silly for the Americans to think that they bought land from Mexico that Mexico never owned. They paid Mexico for our land, the land of the Apaches. Then they told us, we bought you when we bought your land. Obey our laws or we shall punish you. Was there ever a greater swindle? Never, Victorio growled. So we fight white men whom we would never hurt at all if they just stayed home. And they call us evil. Suppose we went to the people of the north, the Canadians, and paid money for the lands of the Americans. Then suppose we told the Americans that they must live by Apache law or be punished. Would they not resist? Fiercely, Victoria growled. I agree with you that we must fight, but the Membrino warriors follow Mangus Coloradus and will for as long as he is chief. Let us go see if we might again persuade him to be a war chief and lead us against the white men. The two made their way to the Membrino village and knew as soon as they looked upon it that something unusual was taking place. People scurried here and there, dogs barked, and horses on a nearby hill were nervous. Victorio and Geronimo began to run. They saw Mangus Coloradus in the center of the village, surrounded by a group of his people. Beside him was a bearded white man whom Geronimo recognized as Jack Swilling, a skilled frontiersman who had lived for a long time in the southwest. Towering over everyone in the group, old Mangus Coloradus was as erect at seventy-two as he had been at seventeen. His hair was snow-white now, but it was still abundant, and it had been carefully dressed. He wore his finest moccasins and buckskins, and he was talking calmly. Long have I led the Membrino Apaches, and always my first thoughts have been for my people. Of late I have been greatly troubled. Constant war is a poor companion, and starvation is a thankless bedfellow. Now comes this messenger from Captain Sherlin of the United States Army. He asks us to go into Captain Sherlin's camp bearing a white flag, and he brings Captain Sherlin's own pledged word that neither I nor any who choose to go with me shall suffer harm. He has promised that the Membrino Apaches will have their own reservation and plenty of food. I believe and I would lead all who choose to go with me to peace and plenty. Geronimo flung himself forward and knelt before his chief. Think, he pleaded. Think carefully before you do this thing. The white men will have much cause for boasting if they may say that Mangus Coloradus is their prisoner. It is a trick, Victorio warned. Mangus Coloradus spoke with the dignity of a chief and from the wisdom of years. You, Geronimo, and you, Victorio, have ever been two of the most hot-headed warriors. Nothing I can say will make you believe that you cannot continue to battle the white man. Experience alone must teach you. Rise and let me pass. Geronimo rose to his feet 
and soon Mangus Coloradus and the little group who had chosen to go with him left the village. The evening fires had been lighted six times and were lighted again when Diablo, a young warrior who had gone with Mangus Coloradus, shuffled back into the village. His eyes were downcast, his tread weary. He walked slowly to a fire and stared at it. For a long while he did not speak. You saw? Geronimo questioned. I saw, Diablo said dully. What saw you? Diablo said, we walked into the soldiers' camp, Mangus Coloradus carrying the white flag that should have been our protection. But soldiers rose up and seized him. They tied our chief as we might tie a Mexican or a dog. The rest of us they herded into an unused stable. I know the rest of the story from Acona, an, an Apache scout who is serving the soldiers. Diablo quieted and stared intently into the fire, as though he could not go on. At last he continued. Into the camp came a Colonel West, an army chief who outranks Captain Sherlan. He talked with some of the soldiers. The soldiers loosed Mangus Coloradus's bonds and left. Only two soldiers remained on guard. Our chief, old and ill, and who must have been weary, laid down by the fire. He slept. One of the guards thrust a long knife, the bayonet that white soldiers carry on the end of their guns, into the fire. When the bayonet glowed red with heat, the soldier touched it against our chief. Mangus Colorado sprang up, as who would not. He started to run, as who would not if awakened in such a fashion. There were two shots, and Diablo fell silent and stared moodily into the fire. End of chapter 10